So, good morning, everybody. Um, when Hans had asked me to, to speak, I said, look, you know, I think we've probably heard a lot of talking heads. Why don't we just, you know, use a case study of someone that we've helped, you know, move two, bu two businesses in the past three months from idea through to commercialization and launch. My personal opinion as context is that this is the most important session, you know, of this whole conference in so much as there's a lot of talk about innovation. What really matters to the C-suite, having been one of those executives, is moving things from idea through to commercialization, getting points on the board, then you earn the right to scale it out. I also believe that it's important to get these things outside the four walls, right, and do so with hybrid cross-functional teams. And so in essence, you know, at a high level, uh, what we do is we enable uh, the world's largest multinationals to launch new lines of business just as we did back at SAP and then once they've done it a couple times to launch their own incubators to build the tide spins right and to build the vooms at scale on repeatable basis of the portfolio of businesses so with that uh, Kevin started a journey back at uh, Stanley Black and Decker that I think was kicked off by Jim right it was our CEO Jim Lurie um took over the helm two years ago, and I, he already knows one of his big legacies that he wants to leave is getting Stanley Black & Decker to become one of the world's great innovators. And so, so what was it that you were seeing in the marketplace by way of context that led you to believe, hey, you know, we need to be building perhaps new businesses? Well, so we are a 175-year-old company. Um, we're really strong in our, in our lanes. And just for a little context, we're about a $13 billion company. Most of that is what you guys know about us is the tools part of our business. So um, for us to be relevant is clear. We need a, a, a new way to think about starting these new lines of businesses, new sources of growth for the company. Great. And so what did you have to start with when we ran across one another? So we had some efforts that we had begun a few years prior. Well. At its base, I think, David, you said it, we are a strong operating company, right? So we're really good at that. Um, that's kind of at odds with <laughs> experimenting and finding new sources of growth. Um, so we had that as a start. We started a digital accelerator out in Atlanta. Um, and the idea was really bring us into the 20, 21st century. Um, and so that was a good start. We got some good talent in that center, started infusing it into the business. Um, we'd set up a few labs around the company um, and the intent there was to kind of detach them from the business, hire guys, let them bring their, their dogs to work and wear ripped t-shirts and think <laughs> differently. Um, and we had some successes, especially with things that were still in our lane. Anytime we got outside of our lane, it became very challenging. Uh, so we had that as a backdrop. Uh, then, about a year ago or so, we got into this exponential uh, organizations piece. and so. If folks are familiar with uh, Salim Ismail from Singularity, uh, we started speaking with him. Our CEO started talking to him. And that really kind of lit a fire, saying, hey, the world's changing. It's changing rapidly, and again, we need to be uh, doing things very differently if we want to be relevant. So that's kind of, I think, where we were when we, we started talking. Great. So, so at that juncture, you had some early ideas. You had started to bring in some interesting talent. You had this objective driven by the CEO of driving interesting new uh, businesses that are exponential in nature. What caused you to look outside for assistance in terms of kind of taking it to the next step from idea through to commercialization? In terms of kind of taking it to the next step from idea through to commercialization? We, so we did not have the DNA to go and, and, and do what we needed to do. Um, again, the imperative was clear. Um, and we wanted to go and partner with folks that had been there, done that had the expertise, had the network, had the ecosystem in place so that we could learn rapidly. We actually have an organization uh, that we stood up to go do this called ELU. It stands for Exponential Learning Unit. So that's at the core of what we're doing is trying to learn. And so that, that's what really drove this. Yep. And, and you know, one of the things that we haven't talked a lot about here at the conference is this notion of, you know, corporate antibodies and the resistance we face as internal entrepreneurs corporate environment, what were you guys experiencing? Because, you know, we like to say people that start a startup 
you know, in the, in the normal world as entrepreneurs, they fight a one-front war, and that's a war in the marketplace. You start a startup inside a large corporation, you fight a two-front war, one in the marketplace and the other with the corporate antibodies. So what were you experiencing right about then in terms of kind of challenges as you were trying to, you know, shift into this new mode? Yeah, it was interesting. I think we kind of took the, the company a little bit by storm uh, with some of these early ideas. Uh, so, you know, we, were a, we got a little running room before people really understood what was going on. When they did, yeah, we have folks kind of asking questions. Why are we looking at that type of business? I mean, that kind of thing, um, a, ch a little chatter like that at the right levels uh, can be damaging. So that's an example of some corporate antibodies. The functions themselves, I would say, um, got it um, and understood and were saying the right things. Hey, we want this to be a separate uh, um, effort and we want to, to give it the breathing room. But that's still a very difficult thing for people to step back from. Okay, and you and the management team had done kind of your tor corporate tourism in Silicon Valley, come in, taking a look around. Yeah. Typically it results with most companies having deep envy, you know, and those entrepreneurs, you know, really being frightened that the disruption is far closer than one could have imagined, but it doesn't close the loop to execution. People still go back, sit in the 10th floor corner, you know, windowed office, look out the window, and have no way to connect with what they just saw. So concretely then, you said, great, we gotta look around, we realize we need some extra help. W what specifically are you looking for at that juncture? Yeah, um, and frankly, we had done a lot of research. I've got a strategy group uh, under me, and we went and scoured the landscape, and we wanted to learn as much as we could in a short amount of time, and frankly, we actually wrote a book. Now, um, it didn't get published, but we learned a lot through that process. Uh, so we had a perspective, we had a perspective on innovation. So we used that research and that perspective to go and, and look out there into the world, and we came across Mach 49. And it was a group of folks that we were simpatico with. Um, you know, people that had been there in the corporate world uh, have, have the, the scars and the bruises, so that we can have a lot less scars and bruises, um, have that network, have that ecosystem, and share a perspective on I think it was uh, said by a few of the folks, uh, I think both Uma and David, is we gotta take that risk off the table uh, before we start committing big capital. And we do believe that we can know a lot more than we think we can know prior to, to starting to invest a, a lot. And, and that was a break, big new thing to bring to the company, frankly, because we're used to uh, making big bets on not a whole lot of information. You know? So this idea of being a lot more thoughtful discipline about, you know, what questions you need answered before you start risking capital uh, was new to us, but from our strategy team, we knew that was important, and so that led us to, to the Mach 49 folks. Yeah, the way, the way we think about it is you can do what I did and spend literally 10 years as an executive at SAP figuring out how to do this, like a lot of the people in the room have, have, have figured it out. In the end, these things are increasingly codified. It is scrum, design thinking, you know, lean. But putting that all in the context of a corporation, and in particular layer, layering on this mothership management, this antibody, you know, with exceptions to standard rules, processing procedures that are required to kick this off really fast. So how do you shorten the cycle times to success, decrease the risk, and increase the probability of launching these new businesses? And so, um, you know, so in essence, that's sort of what we do. You came to the table actually with a really prepared mind, Kevin. So. Um, you had a set of ideas that were reasonably well vetted at their stage. How'd you go about doing that with your, your kind of innovation strategy group? Um, yeah, it, it, um, we've got great folks. I mean, I, we've got an amazing team. Uh, it starts with um, you know, focus on, focusing on that big customer-centered problem. And we had the shiny object syndrome before. We knew we didn't want to be there. So it was all about digging deep and really truly understanding the customer understanding the problem to be solved. Um, so that's really what you know, got us started and got us pointed in the right direction. Um, and then learning from you guys on how to take that and turn that into a solution uh, that's gonna be, you know, the pro get, get you to that product market fit. Yeah, so, so we'll get into exactly how we do that, but at the beginning, you we're very well aware that every company we talk to, you can find internal entrepreneurs. Every company we talk to, you can find good ideas. In the end, if these things get killed, they get, end up getting killed by management, by these antibodies. So where we start is with the ideas you know, that the company has, and we pull management, senior management into a room, 
And we say, great, we're going to do a design thinking session for about two days. We're going to basically work these things. You're going to be at the table. We're all going to be up on our feet, really high energy. And we're going to, in essence, bring in a set of, you know, what I call orthogonal thinkers, experts in this particular business, people that are disrupting your business. Our Mach 49 team of people that have done this inside corporations, have done this inside startups, we're going to hand pick a set of intrapreneurs, right, within your organization. We'll interview them and help you identify them. And we will hand pick a set of dyed in the wool entrepreneurs from our network with the objective of creating hybrid cross-functional teams, half a dozen people we parachute into the valley and walk them through their paces over the course of six months in order to move from idea through to launch. And so, you know, those initial sessions, what they do is they, um, you know, they get the antibodies a, a little acculturated, right? We get all the, you know, preconceived notions, all the orthodoxies on the table. In the end, there's, an, there's always an executive in there that says, no, no, we tried that 10 years ago. Let me give you the story. We can't do that, right? So you got to get all that stuff on the table, and then you have to have real, really experts right next to them in these brainstorming sessions, right, to, to help shift their lens slightly. By the time they walk out of those meetings, one, they have a really good set of information around, you know, what are the assumptions that we're making about these businesses that we're looking to launch, right? So that when we call them again in a month and say, hey, by the way, we pivoted, they'll go, oh, you weren't able to validate that assumption. Got it. I'm totally with you. It's also humbling to walk through the vagaries of this entrepreneurial process, something most corporate executives are not accustomed to. And then, you know, also, this is a live interviewing session. We've got intrapreneurs, we've got entrepreneurs, and, they, you know, basically, some people don't play well with others, some people can't think outside the box. By the end of the Blitz, you know, we brought a lot of talent into that space, we walk out, and there was, you know, for example, there's a guy that we thought was really interesting on paper. We had interviewed him, watched him live, we walked him out the door. Right, so the objective was to remove the largest risks first on the cheapest capital. What space are you playing in and what team are you playing with? Those are some of the largest risks. Yeah, that was probably one of the, I mean, that was a great event. I think that was a great step forward for our innovation efforts because it really raised the visibility within Stanley of what we were doing. Um, and we actually, I don't know if you guys, anybody uses uh, uh, Workplace by Facebook, but we've adopted that within Stanley and so, you know, we can disseminate this information pretty rapidly. And so getting this information out there, um, you know, really helped explain what we're doing from the startup innovation thing. Um, but there are a lot of other aspects that came from it. I mean, the fact that, you know, again, it's the DNA that we don't have that's out there available to, to us. I mean, a guy that was the head product guy for, for Netflix for the past 10 years was in, in the blitz with us. You guys brought, brought them from your, your ecosystem. I mean, that kind of stuff really opens the eyes uh, for a company like us to see that kind of talent that's out there. Yeah, so concretely then we start with the process. We leave that what we call blitz design thinking session where now management knows exactly what we're doing and they're fully bought in because, you know, they put their fingerprints on it, among other things. We parachuted half a dozen people into our facility in Silicon Valley. Um, surrounded by entrepreneurs and other cor corporate teams, maybe half a dozen at any given time from different industries, you know, walking through this process. What was the first step in the process? What did these guys do day one? You recall? <laughs> um, well, we had to get up out of, well, we were up out, out of our chairs the whole time. Let's see. Um, day one was, we trained them on ethnographic level interviewing. Ethnographic. Literally, day one, and then by the end of the day, these guys were doing interviews. And so, so tell us about the interview process as you witness kind of the findings over the, over the various months, 100 to 200 customer interviews. How was that and how did you guys experience that as the company? Yeah, I mean, that, that was another shot across the bow. I mean, how can we make decisions? I mean, Jason always says that's the only currency that matters is what the customer says. Um, again, we were used to making decisions off of anecdotal information. And this is real ground truth um, at a detailed level. So it was really important uh, to us. Uh, and we've actually started adopting that more within the core of our business now, which has just been fantastic. So this uh, getting out there, getting out in the field, and yeah, getting up to 250 interviews is, is invaluable. Yeah, and, and we start with open-ended interviews, then scenario interviews, then stimulus interviews, right, in a really rigorous, thorough fashion that, um, you know, again, our objective as an organization is not to build dependence, it's to build capability. So we've got people shadowing this team all along so they can go back 
and do it on their own. Second phase, beyond validating customer desirability, is validating execution feasibility. In other words, if customers want it, can we build it, with a little asterisk, can we build it, you know, leveraging our unique assets and capabilities as an unfair advantage? And, you know, there were some things that we looked at and we said, hmm, not sure we can pull that off, right? Yep. Yeah, now we've learned quite a bit and, um, you know, we found out some things that didn't make sense for us and we actually had to, to kill a project midway through. Um, so yeah, I mean, and that's, a, that's an unnatural thing for a company that's execution oriented and let's just get this thing done. Okay, we got some, you know, 10 interviews that say this is a bad idea. Okay, we're gonna turn this off. Well, it's, a good, it's good news because we just saved ourselves millions of dollars by making that decision. And normally what we do and what we did in this case is you pivot actually 12 times over yeah. the course of three months before you actually kill this thing. But in the end, um, there are things that went on in SAP when I was at the helm. You know, CEO's pet project, we pissed away $20 million on it before having the guts just to kill it. So having the discipline to kill things as well and not fall in love with things and run a portfolio and fully expect a set to fail is critical. So now we've walked through validating customer desirability, validating product or execution feasibility, and the final one is business viability. And you guys had some pretty stringent and focused requirements for what, what's the nature of the business? You, you were talking about exponential earlier. Yeah. Now these are digital businesses, totally different animals, recurring, re recurring revenue, almost SaaS models. Talk a little bit about that and how, how you thought about that um, as, a, as a bar to, for approval. Um, yeah, Validation. that's a tricky one, right? We've got this mandate now to go think differently, find new sources of growth for the company. Uh, that necessarily takes you outside of your comfort zone or outside of your lane. Um, but there needs to be a certain amount of kind of strategic fit and acceptability. Um, but we do have a pretty uh, um, detailed evaluation process for these. And we call business equity, you know, what's our right to play here? There has to be, a, you know, a certain amount of that. Now I like to say, hey, look, if this is a great opportunity, let's go figure out how to build that, that business equity. But really where we are in our um, evolution, we need to be able to see it. Yeah, and the other thing is, we're having very direct conversations with the CFO. This is a manufacturing business. Yeah. And what we're talking about is, in some cases, I mean, we actually ended up launching two businesses that looked a little bit more like LinkedIn <laughs> than a manufacturing business, which means, you know, is a dollar of revenue the same as another dollar of revenue? revenue? No, actually, it's valued at five times, uh, you know, in terms of market, market validation, actually market value. And how do we get, then, Stanley Black & Decker to understand that a do you know, dollar of this type of revenue is different from a dollar of that type yeah. of revenue? And it takes a while to build SaaS businesses. So, a fundamentally different approach um, that these guys were wrapping their heads around. Yeah, I mean, Jason helped, you know, had direct conversations with, you know, the head of our finance group to try to explain this. And it's, it's a, it is a big uh, shift in thinking. Um, we're going to try to build, get customer acquisition, build a critical mass of customers so that we're gonna see that exponential lift five, six years down the road. That's a tough thing for a, a company like this to, to think about when we're used to acquiring something and plugging in a $100 million uh, company, right? So yeah, that, that, that's still an ongoing kind of evolution for us. Yep, so, so let's fast forward. Yeah. Had the objective, what, three, four months ago to actually start a couple businesses. Yep. Where are we today? So, um, the, so the general um, phases we go through are concept development, incubation, and acceleration. I think that's pretty uh, standard. Uh, we've gone through the incubation on these two concepts and right at the beginning of acceleration, where we're starting to build the, that minimum viable product, uh, and uh, work towards getting those first paying customers. So we're right at the beginning of that. We've got uh, core teams hired, and so we brought in entrepreneurs from the outside, from Mach 49 Network, um, and we all, it's a mix. We also have some Stanley folks on these teams, but these are, are real startups now. We've incorporated, incorporated them as C-Corps, um, give them you know, standard startup type of package, and you know, gosh, I had one Stanley Black & Decker guy coming from a you know, pretty nice, comp package, bonus, stock, all this stuff, and he's walking away from all that, going to his base and getting options that are gonna pay off at a liquidity event in the future. So it's a real startup deal and it's attractive to, to some of these guys. We gotta find the right people. 
Yeah. yeah. So it's notable that this is an occupational hazard. People that get involved with this, you know, at times they don't go back, right? Yeah. Um, but also when it comes to things like, you know, these option packages, I mean, most corporations are not familiar with what would be attractive on the outside to an external venture player, right? In other words, we want to keep our option open to raise external money. And if you frankly, and we had the conversation with legal, if you, if you go with this corporate structure and you go with this option package, you know, the cap table is going to be pretty screwed up and you're not going to be able to drive a term sheet with these guys to the extent you ever want to take external capital. Right. So, you know, really get into getting into the execution details, thinking from the future backwards. Just one, one funny piece on trying to socialize this idea of the startup package and the options. Um, I didn't anticipate that this was going to be that tough of a discussion because we're talking about carving out a 20% option pool on a, on a startup that has no value today. Should be an easy sell for the corporation, right? I had no idea that they were thinking I was, they thought I was going to be giving Stanley Black and Decker options. And we're talking, you know, these small percentages, which obviously are huge <laughs> dollars. And I didn't know I was running up against that misunderstanding. So that slowed me down for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Once we got past that, we were good. Yeah, no, fascinating conversations <laughs> where finally we said, okay, let's just have a conversation yeah. directly with the executives making the decision. And by the way, early conversations with the CEO, I need a direct report to each of your functional line managers direct report that can think outside the box to whom we can go to carve out exceptions to standard rules, processes, and procedures. Because we're going to run into them, and we need someone that can creatively think with us, and we can't get the runaround, and we need to be authorized by the CEO, and the head of IP, or the head of legal, or the head of procurement basically needs to sanction that this person will figure it out for us, work within the bounds of safety for the corporation, but also think creatively to come up with you know, some of these exceptions. So. You know, so we've talked about where you're at. You just literally incorporated two new business launches, launched them. You got the approval board uh, all the way up to the C C CFO and CEO to sign off on that uh, funding. The three months cul culminated in a venture capital caliber pitch. Um, you've got a validated team. You've got a customer validated product. You've got a, a clear, crisp operating plan with uh, milestone gated funding that's been approved by the board. Right, and you've got a set of experiments that you need to run around all dimensions of the business uh, for the next six, 12 months. So, you know, there are a lot of different models, although if I listen to the people in the room, we're converging around one model nightly, nicely, and there are a lot of similarities to what, you know, I had to figure out actually 14 years ago back at SAP. I started with a full head of hair. Well, <laughs> well um, where are you coming out on this incubation thing? So. Uh, What's your summary in general, and kind of what role does it serve with yeah. SBD going forward? Yeah, so this, you know, I think where we're at right now is this incubation model, uh, start creating these startups, is going to be a fundamental part of the strategy. It's one piece of the strategy. So we want to have a thriving kind of innovation system across the business. We already have a ventures team that's doing the typical corporate ventures uh, model. Uh, we're looking at open innovation models, uh, kind of lower the the cap, you know, capital up front needed and, and allow kind of uh, entrepreneurs to take some ideas and, and run with them. Um, so we're, we're trying different models. This one is, uh, you know, we feel good about. We're going to run with this one. We want to add other ways uh, to get there as well. Yeah, back at, back at SAP, we tried, I've tried basically everything. Open innovation, internal innovation, you know, build, buy, partner, invest, everything. And so, you know, we're kind of working from the, you know, future backwards here on a lot of this. Um, and, and landing that model which does build new lines of business, which is truly all the board cares about in the end, responding to disruption, you know, driving new revenue, and then building an internal capability. That's what matters. This, this boil the ocean, cultural, you know, kind of uh, shift, the endless ideation that never closes the loop to execution, right, is not going to last long. That's why the tenure of these chief innovation officers, most of them aren't really clear about what they should be doing. That's why the tenure is 18 months, because you've got that window of opportunity to get some points on the board. If you fail to do it, the pendulum of innovation swings. It goes from, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom in a corporation to, yeah, we got to shut all this down because it doesn't work. So when you have that window of opportunity, you got you to hit it and you got to hit it hard. So, you know, how do you go about scaling this transformation in a company? So great news. You know, we subscribe to the fact that you got to get a couple points on the board and earn the right. Where do you go from here? How do you manage that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we got to manage these startups. We got, you know, um, 
give them the autonomy to run, but we need to be pretty plugged into it. We've got to see, you got to see points on the board. Those points are going to look a little different than they're used to seeing. They're not going to be seeing the $100 million in three years on these things. So it is that, that communication back with uh, the executive leadership and keeping this top of mind. I know it's a, it is a critical part of the, the uh, strategy that they're committed to. It's kind of we, we do need to show those successes to the whole company so we can keep doubling down on this. And final question. Uh, so Kevin is, uh, as of, you know, as of uh, a month, he will be a Californian. Uh, he, yeah. he and his wife are looking at, you know, places in Silicon Valley actually this week, so he's kind enough to come down for this. But, you know, what's the level of corporate commitment? So Jim Lurie basically says this is a, this is a deal that basically he's, he's doing on his watch yeah. uh, for Stanley Black & Decker. You're moving your family out. Your boss, who's a direct report to Jim, moved his family out. What, what are we doing together next? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got, no, we got, we got more to do. So we've got a few more projects in the hopper. Um, we'll probably start later this year. Um, but yeah, the commitment is there. I, I, you know, that's a big deal, uprooting the family from Connecticut to get to California. Wanted to get here, but that's still a big deal. I had to look them in the eye several times, ask them, are you serious about this? And every single time, absolutely. So it's really exciting. Yeah, and we're, we're very grateful. These guys are building a new innovation uh, facility in Redwood City, and they basically said, yeah, we want you guys right down the hall. So we're yeah, also co-locating. So it's, been, it's just been a ton of fun. And, um, and my hat is off to all the entrepreneurs that, <laughs> that actually figured this out on their own because it's not easy. And it only gets easier is the good news from here. I presented this conference five years ago, keynote in New York, and smaller crowd, far less institutionalization of this knowledge. So the good news is it only gets easier from here. And we're very grateful for your time. No, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.